So, there are rumors that Pope Francis is going to change or allow a change to the church teaching on contraception. Now, the question we have to ask ourselves is, can the Pope change the rules on contraception? And the answer is no. The teaching on contraception is not just a matter of Pope Paul VI encyclical Humanae Vitae, which was put out in the 1960s. That was really important, um, but that did not make contraception unlawful. Contraception is contraception, excuse me, is unlawful because it is against the natural law, and it's pretty simple. And this is how it works. All of our human functions have a natural end. And we're not supposed to or allowed to frustrate those natural ends, especially when they're life-giving, uh, unless there is, uh, unless it's unintended. So, for example, um, taking contraception or, or taking an issue where you could frustrate someone's ability, uh, a woman's ability to conceive or a man's ability to, uh, you know, healthily be part of the conception process. If someone was sick, with let's say some sort of cancer and there was a medication that was offered that would um, make someone infertile but they were at a great risk of dying and they needed the medication then they could take that but the secondary effect would be that the person was infertile was uh, not able to conceive it would function in some ways like a contraceptive it's a pretty crude analogy but I think we can understand the logic of it but that's not what contraception is. Willful contraception, elective contraception, is a decision to separate the unitive, which is the aspect of the conjugal embrace where couples come together in that bond of love, and the procreative aspect. So there's a unitive and procreative. Traditional church teaching has always been that the primary reality of marriage, the conjugal act of marriage, is procreative, meaning the procreation of children. Obviously, uh, you know, a, I don't want to call a secondary in a sense, but obviously a, a, an obvious effect of that is unitive. It is an expression of love that's for married couples to talk about. Um, <clears throat> but we see the order of this in Genesis. Adam and Eve are to be fruitful and multiply. The first um, uh, blessing or precept or command or whatever you want to call it uh, from God is that Adam and Eve in their original marriage, the fruits of that will be to procreate. That is the primary end of marriage. That does not mean that uh, procreation should be forced. That does not mean that um, there isn't supposed to be a consensual marital love. That's supposed to be there as a given. But it does mean that um, the primary reality of the conjugal embrace of marriage um, is that there will be an openness to contraception. And the reason for that is essentially because, well, for one, it's in scripture, but also feelings come and go. People's attractions come and go. Uh, but once we make that bond as a married couple to be together, uh, then there is a reality of marriage, again, that married couples know about. And that thing always retains the power of procreation. Okay, so people's um, affections for one another over a long period of time may go up and down. I mean, marriages can be difficult, life can be hard, and so on and so forth. But the actual marital, marital embrace always maintains a procreative aspect. It's inextricable. You can't take it away unless you do that in an artificial sense, which is against the actual nature of why marriage was created. It's against the natural law. For example, we can use another analogy. There's a reason why um, when someone struggles with eating food in the wrong way, whether it's uh, bulimia, so they expel the food uh, after they've eaten it rather than digesting, or it's anorexia and that they don't want to eat the food. There's a reason why we call those things disorders. Because the body is ordered towards food, towards eating. This is why you feel hunger. You have a desire for food, which you experience with a sensation that's called hunger. And of course you can abuse that. Uh, people can eat for the sake of eating, but nonetheless, 
one of the natural realities of hunger and eating food is that your body has this desire for nourishment and eating the food provides that nourishment. If somebody frustrates the natural desire for food, we call that a disorder. This reality must apply based on the natural law and the reality of the human person to sexual activity as well. It is disordered in a moral sense to frustrate the natural end artificially. Again, it can happen by accident. It can happen because of side effects, but to frustrate it intentionally, it is a disorder to do so within the marital embrace. That's not something people want to hear. They don't want to hear that contraception is disordered. Contraception is disordered. Using contraception is sexual disorder. Uh, just like um, frustrating um, eating is a eating disorder. It's a psychological damaging process. You don't believe me? Look around. I mean, look at our society. Look what has happened since we have uh, made contraception uh, legal in our society. I mean, it's, you know, there is no pornography industry without contraception. There is no abortion without contraception because abortion essentially acts as contraception. Uh, there is no casual sex without contraception. I mean, follow it through. Contraception, uh, artificial contraception is like, from another example, if we continue with this eating analogy, it's like, you know, trying to create calorie-free food or something. Um, you can't do that without making it unhealthy, without making it uh, disordered, without making it unsatisfying which then people will go for more and more and more and develop deeper and deeper and deeper disorders until their relationship with food becomes completely insane. And we've also seen that in our society. We kind of see these two processes uh, side by side, a, complete, uh, disor a completely disordered relationship with food itself and a completely disordered relationship with sexuality itself. This is why uh, primarily Christ talks about some demons only being cast out by uh, prayer and fasting. This is why uh, St. Paul talks about the God of the, the pagans being their bellies, meaning they listen to their loins. Whether that mean they go after food in a disordered way, you hear of these old, you know, weird ways of eating where they vomit after they ate too much, or they had rudimentary forms of contraception, which were gruesome. The point is they went after their loins. They would justify their um, base desires as being lawful because they wanted them to be. And that's the effect of contraception. I understand there are plenty of people who would argue that, you know, it's responsible uh, for contraception because, you know, uh, what about health of the mother and so on and so forth. Well, here's the thing. There's a reason why the analogy of comparing food to, uh, you know, the sexual embrace in marriage fails because you actually have to eat to survive. You don't have to procreate to survive. It's just a fact. Um, so the idea that you would have to use contraception because you have to be having quote unquote safe sex is to assume that you have to have sex in the first place, which is just not the case. You have to go to the bathroom. You have to eat. You have to breathe. You have to drink water. You have to sleep. You don't have to do the other thing. You could just exercise this thing called self-control. Imagine that. So Pope Francis, he may come out and, and say crazy things. He may uh, even put out documents that are probably going to be vague and, you know, it'll be, you know, different bishops conferences, which is what happened in Canada in the 1960s with the so-called Winnipeg statement, sort of, well, you know, use your conscience and so forth. They're all rubbish. They mean nothing. There is no possible way for the church to make it licit to use contraception. Um, we haven't even got into the fact that hormonal contraception essentially acts as an abortifacient, basically uh, stops implementation once a child has already been conceived. So it's actually just sort of a, a mini abortion, if you will, if that term works, I don't know. Um, and even with the, the, uh, barrier methods, you know, condoms and so forth, look what happened to Onan in the old Testament, the sin of Onan. I, I think it's Genesis chapter 38. He is supposed to marry his brother's wife after his brother dies, which was the custom. And, uh, rather than conceiving a child, he spills his seed, as it says, which is just a method, a, a rudimentary method, and God strikes him down and kills him. So scripture tells us that when you spill your seed, God kills you. 
And the natural law says that when you use methods to frustrate it, uh, you have you are doing something that is akin to an eating disorder. So you can choose to uh, bring the wrath of God on yourself uh, or practice something that is akin to sexual bulimia or you could just follow the natural law and have something called self-control. Again, let me know what you think in the comments. Uh, like this video, subscribe to this channel. Uh, check out the links in the description to help us grow in our efforts. You can buy my books by clicking the links in the comments and also in the description. This has been the Kennedy Report. Until next time, God bless. Music